Who are the people we'd love to kick out of society? Let's find out. Starting with number six, The Sting. For the Rolex Ripper gangs terrorizing the streets of London, the clock is ticking. These sneaky thieves have been targeting people wearing their luxury watches, snatching them right off their wrists. But what they don't know is that the next wrist they grab might be attached to the long arm of the law. Scotland Yard got fed up with these Rolex rippers, a name used to describe the type of gang that basically mugs people with high-end jewelry, wreaking havoc in the city. The problem has been steadily growing, with over 300 watches stolen in just the West End alone, totaling nearly 4 million pounds over the course of only six months. So the cops cooked up a plan and sent out a squad of undercover officers decked out in fancy watches as bait, prowling the streets of Soho where these thefts were happening most. The brave officers strutted around, luring in the robbers like flies to honey. And it worked like a charm. Hooded thugs robbed them, brazenly ripping the watches off their wrists. But before the crooks could make a run for it, Backup officers swooped in, tasers blazing. The whole operation was caught on CCTV, showing the undercover heroes quickly getting ambushed left and right. Fortunately, justice was just as swift, and over the course of two operations, the cops nabbed 27 of these criminals. So what ended up happening to them? Well, let's just say these thieves won't be enjoying any fancy watches where they're going. 21 of them were convicted, with 14 sentenced to a hefty 26 years behind bars. And thanks to this sneaky operation, watch theft in certain posh parts of London plummeted by an incredible 50%. So how did the police catch these time thieves, you may wonder? Well, it was all about data and smarts. The cops analyzed when and where these crimes were happening, then sent in their undercover crew to turn the tables. Most of the victims were just unsuspecting guys out for a night out on the town, so it wasn't too difficult to make believable decoys out of the officers. The thieves thought they were easy targets, but little did they know they were messing with the wrong crowd. So if you're thinking about strutting around central London with a shiny timepiece, maybe don't. While the police put a good dent in the operation, the problem is pretty far from solved. Just stick to busy areas, travel in packs, and maybe invest in some insurance. And if you do get mugged, remember, no watch, no matter the price or sentimental value, is worth it. Number five, the jacket. An unnamed shoplifter entered a store in Times Square and opened fire, injuring one tourist. The incident occurred after a security guard approached the shoplifter and his two accomplices to ask for their receipts as they left the store. One of the shoplifters fled, but the other two couldn't sneak away from the suspicious security guard who grabbed their shopping bag, which contained a coat they were allegedly attempting to steal. The guard approached one of the teenagers who brandished his weapon and fired. Although he was aiming for the guard, he missed and hit some random Brazilian tourist who was shopping at the store in the leg. The victim barricaded herself in a storage room while she waited for help to arrive. An ambulance eventually took her to a nearby hospital. Police chased after the armed shoplifter who fired shots at the officers as he fled the scene. He rushed into the 49th Street subway station where officials feared he would continue his crime spree. One officer drew his weapon inside the subway station but knew he couldn't fire with that many people around. But the busy platform didn't deter the shoplifter who left a trail of clothing behind him as he ran down the stairs to the train. He shot at the police for a second time in the subway station despite being unprovoked and managed to make his escape. His decision to aim at the cops has him facing charges for his actions, if they could catch him. Officials offered $13,000 for information that could lead to the teenager's arrest. So many things here. How badly did he need that jacket? He could have just dropped it and ran off. So he went from getting nothing to most likely prison time, if they ever catch him, that is. Number four, the parasite. Charity leader Chloe Campion stole $36,000 from a vulnerable client with Down syndrome and dementia. Campion worked for the British-based charity Imagine, Act, and Succeed, an organization that provided adults with severe learning difficulties with accommodations. As a leader at the charity, Campion worked closely with multiple clients. Although she seemed like a reliable and hardworking employee, Campion was keeping dark secrets. Someone had sent an anonymous letter to the charity's upper management to tell 
them that Campion was stealing money to fund her gambling problem. The mother of two immediately confessed to her crimes once she found out that her employer had already been conducting a formal investigation into the allegations. For about five months, Campion drained the bank account of her vulnerable client, Joan Anderson, by taking Anderson's debit card under the guise of buying something on her behalf. Campion had the victim's account information on her computer, and rather than deleting it, she helped herself to the funds so she could feed her gambling obsession. Campion's gambling problem supposedly stemmed from her developing PTSD following the difficult birth of her first child. At the same time, her partner received a cancer diagnosis, her former employer's business collapsed, and she lost her grandfather, which admittedly sounds like a lot to be going through all at once. So she turned to gambling as a way to cope with the stress. Since gambling is known to be stress relieving, right? Seriously, sure, gambling's fun, but it makes everything even more stressful. That was probably the opposite of what she should have been doing. Anyway, Campion soon realized that she couldn't stop, so she started stealing. Eventually, Campion was arrested and pleaded guilty. Although she was open and cooperative during the investigation, the prosecution discovered that she made several other transactions on Anderson's account after her police interview. Hannah Forsyth, Campion's defense attorney, told the court that her client was dealing with mental health struggles and needed help. Forsyth said that Campion was also now seeing a doctor who prescribed her medication for her anxiety. Campion was also attending therapy and weekly Gamblers Anonymous meetings. The defendant was ready to pay all the money back, but feared that going to prison would be too distressing for her two young children and husband, who was still undergoing scans. But not everyone felt compassion for the former charity leader. Several people involved in the investigation pointed out that Anderson needed care and compassion, which Campion exploited for her own gain. By the time she appeared in court, Campion had already paid back almost $25,000 of the money she took. The judge ordered her to complete 30 days of rehab, follow a three-month curfew, and repay the outstanding amount of money she owed Anderson. This was definitely a twist in that she was able to pay back a lot of the money she stole, unlike the vast majority of scams we cover. Number three, seeking asylum. Sahid Aziz, an asylum seeker from Nigeria, falsely claimed refugee status in the UK by alleging persecution from Boko Haram because of his, eh, let's call it, preferences for other men. Boko Haram, for those unaware, is a religious extremist group based out of Nigeria that has become known for its, we'll just call it, unconventional tactics. However, Aziz went on to father three children with three different women in Britain and orchestrated a 220,000 pound Facebook and eBay parcel fraud scheme. Aziz collaborated with Nigerian fraudsters to persuade victims into sending high-value goods to various addresses under false pretenses. He then intercepted those items and sold them in his brother's electronic shop, making roughly 220,000 pounds over 14 months, stealing items from about 270 victims. Police caught up to Aziz while he was dropping off his son at school. Aziz panicked and hid a bunch of incriminating smartphones in the child's bag right before he was nabbed. The devices contained evidence of Aziz's involvement in the fraudulent activities, including videos showing stolen items to buyers on the black market. Pleading guilty to charges of conspiracy to commit fraud and possession of criminal property, Aziz faces sentencing with a potential prison term of up to six years. Additionally, nine other people implicated in the scam await sentencing, while others involved haven't been caught yet. For his part, Aziz says that he was the real victim here, since he was persecuted for his what we'll call partner preferences back in Nigeria. Number two, the squatter. Army officer Lieutenant Colonel Dahlia Dower got a nasty surprise while on active duty in Chicago. A man with a laundry list of crimes under his belt was crashing in her Atlanta home that was in the process of being sold. Vincent Simon, who has had multiple run-ins with the law, decided to make himself cozy in her $500,000 pad while she was away. When Dower found out, she wasn't happy. But here's the totally stupid thing. The police said their hands were somehow tied, calling it a civil matter. Dower, like most people hearing this story, couldn't believe it. The lieutenant colonel was itching to give Simon a taste of his own medicine, but alas, she had to play by the rules. Simon said he had a lease and had paid $19,000 for six months' stay. It sounds totally shady, right? Well, as it turns out, it was shady. The number on the lease was as fake as a $3 bill. Dower, rightfully furious, served Simon with eviction papers. But guess what? He's got the right to fight it out in court. So now Dower's stuck in limbo, waiting for the wheels of justice to turn, 
while Simon lounges around in her fancy house. And to add insult to injury, the sale of her home is on hold. Looks like it's going to be a long, bumpy ride through the eviction process for Dower. It's so weird that squatters' rights have evolved into this too. Squatters' rights, also known as adverse possession laws, were meant to prevent people from just abandoning their property and encouraging owners to develop the property instead of just letting it go to ruin. Which makes some sense, right? If people know that they could lose their property by not maintaining it, they are more inclined to not let that happen. How we got from that idea to just some dude breaking into a house being sold and claiming it is total nonsense. What do you think of squatters' rights? If you're enjoying this video, be sure to stay right here to find out the scary way this girl watched herself get scammed in real time and couldn't do anything about it. Number 1. The Squatter 2 an unnamed Los Angeles squatter decided to upgrade his digs to a luxurious Hollywood Hills mansion, transforming it into a studio for OnlyFans content. This guy went all out too, changing locks, faking leases, and even renting rooms to adult content models. When real estate agents Emily Randall Smith and her husband showed up for an open house, they stumbled upon the squatter shenanigans. Lockbox missing? Check. Mystery mailbox? Check. And surprise, surprise, a random dude snoozing inside. So they called the police and... As you'd expect, the cops couldn't initially kick the squatters out. But after a second call to 911, they got to the bottom of it when one of the OnlyFans models answered the door. Turns out, the guy running the show had concocted a fake lease and was hosting wild parties and adult shoots, treating the Hollywood Hills mansion like it's in San Fernando. If you know, you know. After a couple of weeks, the squatter squad finally got the boot, leaving behind a mess that would make your grandma faint. Think scattered belongings, doggy doo doo and destroyed security systems. While no arrests were made that night, just some weak citations for trespassing, the real estate duo hopes the brains behind the operation faces justice. Maybe it's time for some Hollywood Hills homeowners to invest in some heavy-duty security, since this squatter situation seems to be a growing problem that isn't going to disappear anytime soon. So we can't walk around with nice watches, we can't buy or sell things online, and we can't own expensive houses. If the pandemic didn't force us to stay inside, it seems like these horrible members of society will. Can we like make a giant landfill or something to put them in? Life was looking good for Charlotte Morgan. She had been offered a new job and had just finished talking to a co-worker about her future plans when she went to her local gym for her evening workout on Wednesday, August 24th, at Virgin Active Gym in Chiswick Park, London. It wasn't until 9.30pm when she finished exercising and went to the locker room to get her things that her nightmare began. She discovered that the padlock she used on her locker was gone and her backpack had been stolen. Certain that nobody would have been able to figure out the code to unlock the padlock, she was convinced that somebody must have used wire cutters. However, how could a person get away with doing something like that in the open? Charlotte was about to find out that the security systems that the gym had in place were no match for a sophisticated thief. All of Charlotte's most valuable possessions were inside of her backpack. It was where she kept her cell phone, bank card, house keys, and bike lock keys, all of which were now in the thief's possession. Without her cell phone, she had no way of calling the police or reaching out to a friend or family member for help. She rushed to the front desk, where two other members stood looking concerned. They entered the gym at the same time she did, and she found out that one of them had their belongings stolen too. Another odd thing that happened when they went to check in earlier that night was that the electronic entry system was down, so they had to write their names on a piece of paper instead. With the gym not being as secure as it would typically be, her fear turned to her stolen bank card. She had to jump through many hoops to get her bank account frozen. The staff at Virgin Active refused to let her use their phone or computer, claiming it went against their security policy. Eventually, a colleague came to her aid and let her use their phone. Before she could find out if there were any unauthorized charges to her account, the call handler forced her to answer a series of security questions to confirm her identity. Once her identity was approved, she was given the long list of transactions charged to her card. Between her starting her workout and calling Satlander's hotline, thousands of pounds had been spent. Suddenly, she was helplessly watching her money be spent in real time. The first transaction was just after 8pm at the Apple Store in Westfield Shopping Center, located in West London, where they spent £3,000. At around 9pm, they moved on to a second Apple Store on Regent Street, spending around £1,000. The last transaction was at Selfridges, where an initial £750 was charged. 
By the time they were able to put the hold on the account, the stores had already closed for the night. If the gym let her access her information on their computer, then she would have been able to stop the thief sooner. Santander should have noticed that the purchases being made on her card weren't normal. In fact, they were completely different from her regular spending pattern. She had never shopped at an Apple store before, let alone been to two other stores on the same night. Also, she would rarely spend a lot of money at once. She knew that there were supposed to be protections in place to stop this from happening. Shocked, she asked why the bank didn't try to stop these transactions. It turned out that texts querying the purchases were sent to her stolen phone. If she had her phone, then she would have immediately been able to stop this from happening. Instead, because the fraudster had her phone, it was easy for him to approve every single transaction and continue their shopping spree. All the while, Charlotte was left frantically trying to figure out what to do. Hoping that she reached the bank in time to stop anything else from being charged to her account, she was horrified when the call handler informed her that there was an additional pending charge of £3,000 to her account. She was watching herself getting scammed in real time. The criminal spent more money on their shopping spree than Charlotte had in her entire account. Already upset that the text checking for fraudulent payments went to her stolen phone, she didn't understand why her account didn't overdraw. It should have never been possible for so much damage to be done to her account. The Santander call handler told her that money was transferred from her savings account in increments of 2,500 pounds. Her life savings were in that savings account and could have helped her stay afloat while she waited for the rest of the charges that night to be reimbursed. Not only did someone have her bank card, but they also managed to access her entire account at Santander. Left in shock, Charlotte found herself stranded at the gym that night. The keys to unlock her bike were gone, her house keys were stolen, and she couldn't call for an Uber or reach out to her landlord without her phone. It wasn't possible to get a hotel without any money, so Charlotte resorted to spending the night at her office where she was a TV producer. She sat at her desk all night as she researched what had happened to her and tried to figure out how she would get her money and possessions back. In the morning, she contacted her landlord and he gave her a new key to her house. Then began the excruciating wait for answers. Police told her when she filed her initial report that they would get back to her in a few weeks once they reviewed the security footage and Santander said they would investigate the case too. Unfortunately, a few days after the initial incident happened, there was a long weekend that delayed the answers she desperately needed. The anticipation was so grueling that she could barely eat or sleep. Virgin Active UK refused to take responsibility for what happened, stating that they never take fault for theft. They claimed that the turnstiles were in the middle of a quick reboot when Charlotte checked in that night, which was the reason why a member of the staff was writing down people's names as they entered. Members of Virgin Active Gym in Chiswick Park were also never told about the theft, even though another woman had her thing stolen that night too. But turning off the turnstiles and just writing names is still breaking protocol for security anyways. Santander took it a step further and even blamed Charlotte for the situation. She was accused of either writing the PIN number on her bank card or writing it out on a piece of paper that she kept in her bag. They went as far as saying that she must have shared the number with colleagues, friends, or a family member before they told her that she wouldn't be reimbursed for the transactions charged to her account. There was no proof that her negligence caused what happened, but the fact that her PIN was used meant that Santander refused to accept the blame. She took to Twitter to share her story. She detailed the entire ordeal in a series of tweets from the card entry system not working that night to Virgin and Santander refusing to accept fault. Tens of thousands of people shared the tweets and she received a flood of responses. Local firemen offered to free her still locked bike and a nearby restaurant offered her a gift card for a free dinner. A member of Virgin Active in Chiswick Park wrote a reply where she questioned if it was safe for her to keep going there. People also sent her links to places where she could report Santander and Virgin Active UK for mishandling the entire situation. A bank security expert confirmed that the most likely thing that happened was that the thief took the SIM card out of her phone. Charlotte had so many unanswered questions. How did the thief know getting into the gym was going to be so easy? How could they have hacked her padlock? How were they then able to bypass her phone's facial recognition and passcode to gain access to her phone? How did they figure out her bank card's PIN code? How were they able to change her bank details so easily? Our question is, were they a member of the gym and just decided to do the crime since they could get in easily? Santander insisted that Charlotte was at fault and that her money was lost due to her own negligence, but a Twitter user helped Charlotte piece together one likely explanation. All the thief needed to change her bank security passwords and PIN was her bank card and the SIM card from her phone. 
Once they had that, they just needed to move the SIM card from Charlotte's phone into their own, where it would then bypass needing the thumbprint security or facial recognition that it would need on Charlotte's phone. However, Santander claimed that it would depend on how a user logged into the app on their phone and that they wouldn't be able to get into it without a passcode or using biometrics to obtain the PIN. They also clarified that the in-app PIN resets are common for UK banking apps and not a feature unique to Santander. A few days after Charlotte's tweets, Santander had a change of heart. The bank called her and agreed to reimburse her for the fraudulent charges. They gave Charlotte a long apology and admitted that they handled the situation poorly and were ultimately at fault. If her story didn't go viral, would Santander have given the money back? Or were they doing it just because they basically were guilt-tripped into it? Following Santander's lead, Virgin Active UK also acknowledged their role in the incident. They admitted to Twitter user at Viva Jinsu that their security machine was broken when she entered and that the staff didn't even bother checking people's memberships before letting them through. Virgin Active UK also claimed that they would do whatever it takes to win back Charlotte's trust, but it might be too late. Charlotte confessed to losing all of her trust in banks and gyms. Now, she always locks her SIM card with a PIN number and separates her bank card from her phone. She was still paying off her phone when it was stolen and, as expected, she's still being held responsible for the rest of the payments, as she didn't have any phone insurance. Unfortunately for Charlotte, she still has 20 monthly payments left beginning in October of 2022. These types of simple gym thefts have apparently been becoming more common in locker rooms in London. Many people have already contacted Charlotte to say they had a similar experience after her story went viral. Charlotte's now actively advocating for change and wants to see police, gyms, and banks working together to stop anyone else from going through the same experience as her. Click to watch one of these next videos. Let us know in the comment section what you'd rather have. Free, all expenses paid travel for life, or no rent or mortgage for life where you live right now.